Hey, this is Nathan Tabor. Thank you for tuning into this. What a unique and different times that we're living in, right? And so when uh, uh, Jacob reached out to me and said, Hey, would you teach a Sunday school lesson? And what would you like to talk on? I thought, you know, finding and maintaining joy in such a unique time as this, um, you know, with jobs being lost and how do we pay our bills and uh, where are our kids going to go to school and graduations and all that else going on? How can we as Christians find joy and also maintain it? Uh, and just, you know, for clarity here, so we're all on the same page. When I talk about joy, I'm talking about the definition out of the Strong's Accordance of being, you know, cheerful, cheerfulness, a calm delight, um, a gladness. Uh, it's different than that in being happy because happy is an emotion. Happy is something that comes and goes. Uh, you're happy until someone rear-ends you. And then the emotion is, you know, quickly turns from happy to not so happy, right? Uh, whereas joy is more, you know, it's the state of mind. It's the contentment. It comes from and through our relationship with God. And without that relationship with God, then we don't have and we can't maintain the joy. So, you know, where does that joy come from? It's from God, right? Ecclesiastes 2.26 says, For God giveth to a man joy. And then Psalm 16.11 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. So joy comes from God, and when we're in his presence, we have that fullness of joy. So, you know, if you've been looking for it and you've been trying to find it, as I do in my own life, you know, when I feel myself drifting away from God, I can feel my contentment. I can feel my stability and my balance kind of, you know, kind of like sand when you walk on the beach. It's shifting underneath me. Well, as you are moving away from God, that joy is going to shift from underneath you. And it's really, you know, me or you shifting away from it. And, you know, at a time like this, with all that's going on, you know, when joy is, is challenged, when our lives are challenged, like James 1, 2 says, My brother, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, which means various types of temptations. And, you know, I've, I've read this Bible verse my entire life, grew up in the church and, you know, all of that. And it's kind of like, you know, God has a pretty wicked sense of humor, right? Hey, I'm going to have all these things go on in your life. And, you know, when you look at the definition of temptations, it's a, an experiment, a trial, a temptation it's a, a trial or a probation period or you're being tested, you're being tried. So it could be, you know, literal just like temptation of sin, but it could also be a situation that we're put in like COVID-19. And it's kind of a, a wicked sense of humor of, of God. Hey, let me put you through this. Let me put your family through this. Let me put the church through this. Let me put, you know, society and the state and the government and the world through something, but I want you to have joy during it. It's like, for a long time I thought, how can you, you know, as you're growing up and being young, how can you find joy if your child's laying in the hospital, you know, sick? How can you find joy if, you, if you've had a death in your family or you've lost your job or whatever's going on? And that's not what this is saying here, right? It's not saying, hey, find joy in the horrible thing that's happened to you or find joy in that thing that's, you know, really tempting. No, it's not that joy. It's finding joy in our relationship with Christ that we're saved and that at some point this is going to end. It's either going to end while we're here on earth or it's going to end when we die or it's going to end when Jesus comes back. And that's the joy of it, right? As Christians, this is not all what you know, this is not all we can expect out of our lives because there's so much more. God has so much more planned. Whether it ever comes to fruition here on this earth or not, that's not the point because I've got a mansion for me in heaven and you've got a mansion for you in heaven. COVID nineteen don't care about it. 
So it's finding, you know, joy during this temptation, during this trial. And I know, I'll be the first to admit, it's really easy to say. That is something that, you know, rattle off the Bible verse, I love God, I trust God, and I'm going to find joy in all the circumstances until life is standing right in front of me. Till something just hits me right between the eyes that I have to, you know, the old saying of, you know, put up or shut up. And when it comes right down to it and it's standing in front of me and I've got to deal with it and I've got to, you know, make sure that my joy is intact when I'm going through something, it's a different situation. And I think we as Christians, we as believers, we need to be a little more open about that. We need to talk to other people about that. We need to share the, the stories, the things that we've been through, the hardships that we've been through to, to let others know that, hey, you're not alone. There's hope in this. You know, there, there is an, a light at the end of the tunnel because when we're going through something, we, it's really easy to get drawn back in and to kind of have to sit back and, and wonder what are other people thinking or how am I going to get out of this or what am I going to talk to God about or how am I going to do this? And it can, it can be overwhelming. I've been there. Even during the last two months of, I mean, I'm self-employed. Jordan is self-employed. Um, no clients for me in my coaching and consulting or real estate and all her travels canceled. And it's like, you know, here, James 1, 2 says, find joy in all circumstances. So if I were just to stop there, it's very, what can I say, depressing. It's very um, almost uh, unbearable. But the good thing is, is that it doesn't stop there. Because there are many ways in the scriptures there are dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of how, you know, someone has made a mistake or how someone has gone through a, a horrible, you know, the story of Job. And um, you can go into the scriptures and just look at all the things that people went through and then how God worked in them and through them and around them and how things turned out in their life for his glory and how Things were restored and how God used them. And so that's kind of where I want to spend the last little bit here of, of I'm not, I, obviously for time and also knowledge, I can't dig into all of those, but I want to tell you five things that kind of in my life that I can turn to at any given time and say, if my joy is slipping, if I feel it sifting underneath my feet and I feel that contentment going away and that calmness that's probably the, my favorite word about joy is, is the calmness of, you know, using that illustration of a car wreck. When somebody wrecks into you, instead of going berserk and just flipping your lid, maintaining a calmness. Yeah, you might be upset. The adrenaline's pumping, but there's still a calmness there. So when I feel that, you know, sifting, there, these are a couple things, five things that I've kind of in my own life identified, and I wanted to share them with you because... Uh, they apply to you as well. Now, some of them you might already have already mastered, and some of them you might not even have thought of. Um, so I hope you will, you know, take this in the heart that I'm, I'm going to say it. The first is to confess your sins. I know in my own life, I mean, at times it's like I get so busy. I got, you know, things going on, and I'm like, oh, yes, you know, I shouldn't have done that, but I never really take the time to, to really confess and 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, if your joy is slipping, if my joy is slipping, you know, think of it this way. After you've been out in the yard working all day and you're all hot and sweaty or you know, you've been doing something, you know, digging a, a, a hole to plant bushes or you know, renovating your front yard or painting or whatever you've been doing during this quarantine that has gotten you all dirty, does it feel really good at the end of the night to take your, all your old dirty clothes off and take a shower or take a bath and be all nice and fresh and clean and you don't feel sticky and you don't feel dirty? 
Well, that's the equivalent of going to God and confessing our sins. It's a cleansing. It gets all the grime off of us. It gets all the dirtiness off of us. It gets all the guilt off of us. And we're able to give that all to God. And so in that cleansing process, we're able to get that relationship back with God. We're able to draw closer to Him, which gives us the ability to maintain our joy. So finding it, maintaining it, comes from confessing. You know, James 4.10 says humble. You know what that word humble there means? In our dictionary today, humble is more like, oh, let me, you know, kind of be feeble and, oh, it is kind of that, but it's just, it's coming to the Lord and a lowness and in, in depending on Him. God, I can't do this without you. And that's a different mentality than being like feeble and just, oh, you know, you're, you know, let me just kind of be hesitant here on everything I say because I don't want to come off as prideful. That This here is coming to God and saying, humble yourself. I'm depending on you, God, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So if you go to the Lord in a humble spirit, in a lowliness, and God, I can't do this on my own, and I can't right now, with all that's going on, I'm having to go to God and say, God, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know what my business is going to be like, and I don't know, you know, and and the list goes on and on, and and I'm going to have to depend on you. Because if I don't do that, the what ifs in my mind, what if this happens and what if that happens, it sucks all the joy out of my life and it throws in misery and stress and anxiety. So James 4.10 here, you know, humble yourselves and he will lift you up. You got to have that confession, that heart of, hey, I need God during this time. And this is probably one of my favorites here, the Psalms 51.12. You know, in context here, David has had an affair with Bathsheba and he's going to God and confessing because he's he's guilty, but he's miserable. He says, restore unto me. So he's going to God and saying, hey, I've been wrong. I didn't do right here. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. So he went, he humbled himself. He confessed his sins. He got right with God because he knew that's where his joy was. Second one here is to remember God's in control. That's one of those really easy to say, right? It's good Facebook advice. God is in control. And, you know, do the little emoji with your hands up and, and, and cheer on. And it's really easy to say, but it's one of those that we have to not only say, but we have to apply. God is in control. I don't know what the purpose is of COVID-19. I don't know what the purpose is of a lot of things in life, but I know God has a plan. And I know he has a purpose. And Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Don't fret over it. Don't pull your hair out over it. Don't get, um, you know, growing up in Alabama, North Carolina too, you've heard the phrase, don't be tight as a tick. And if you haven't heard that, Google it. If you've heard it, you know what it means, right? Don't get so tight that you're almost to explode. Because at some point, a tick does explode. And he's saying, do not be dismayed, for I am thy God. He's saying, I'm in control. You know, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. I will strengthen thee. Well, how can we be strengthened by God if we're not remembering God? How can we ask for his help? How can he hold us up if we're not paying attention to him, if we're ignoring him? And the answer is he can't. Now, yes, he he is powerful enough to do that on his own, but we have to do our part. We have to remember God. We have to remember who's in control. And so this is right here saying, you know, don't be dismayed and don't fear. And one of my favorite verses is 2 Timothy 1, 7. You know, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So if you find yourself, and especially in this time or any time where that, you know, anxiety is taking over, and stress is taking over, and you just can't figure out, you know, what's going to go on and how it's going to go on, you know, turn to 2 Timothy 1.7. That dismay, that fear, that all that that you're having is not from God. Because God says it's not from Him, but He gives us a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. I mean, during these times, I mean, don't you feel like, I mean, you might lose your mind? 
you know, things just might go like, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, God says that's not from him. And the third here is, you know, focus on positive things. It's really easy um, in my mind to just go to negative. Well, why is the this elected official doing that? Why are they making this decision? Why have they thought about this? And just to immediately go into all the negative things. Well, Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good. It's hard to have a, a, a merry heart when I'm not focusing on positive things. When I'm not focusing on God, when I'm not focusing on what he wants me to do or what he wants me to be, but I kind of turn the, the other. And, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm focusing on bad things. It's not that I'm you know, doing anything wrong from a worldly standpoint, and I'm sure you're not either. It's just that my focus is not on having a merry heart. And it says it will do me good like medicine. What does it say about a broken spirit? It says it drieth the bones, sucks the life out of you. So it's saying right here, if you have a merry heart, it's like medicine that's good for you. If you have a negative outlook, if you're a naysayer, if you're always focused on the negative, it sucks the life out of you. And it does. And it takes the joy away. So we've got to be really cautious at any time, but especially times like this, to focus on the positive. What does God want for us, you know, out of this? What is his, you know, I don't know what his plan is, but I know for, for sure a couple things, you know, to show the love of Christ to others. Uh, just the other day, and to share the gospel, but just the other day, you know, Amazon guy comes up and he's delivering a little package. And it was one of these days, you know, we've had 27 degree days and 85 degrees days. And it was one of the hotter days. And as he's handing me this envelope, I said, hey, man, you want a Mountain Dew or a Coke or a bottle of water? You would have thought that I said to him, hey, man, you want $500? I mean, he was like, oh. And he's, he kind of lost, you know, expression and just kind of looking around. He's like, um, yeah, man, I mean, I, you know, he's just sweating. He's like, I haven't had a chance to stop and get anything. But, oh, yeah, man, I would really like something like that. And then, so here, I, you know, I hand him the drink. And right behind it, I hand him a track. Because now he's, you know, he's going to stand there and he's going to crack, you know, his drink, crack his drink open and take a sip. And I get to say to him, hey, man, do you, do you know the good Lord? Do you go to church anywhere? You know, I could have been just, oh, hum, and oh, thanks for delivering this. You know, you're an hour late or this was supposed to be here yesterday. I could have done it in a negative way, but would it have changed things? So, hey, you know, have a merry heart. Have a positive attitude. Jeremiah 29, 11, which is a you know, very famous verse. You know, it says, God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God wants us to have a life of peace. He is thinking that for us, but we have to do our part. We have to have that positive outlook. The fourth thing is trust in the Lord. You know, again, this is one of those that's really easy to say. Oh, I trust in God. Oh, I, you know, I'm a man of faith or I'm a woman of faith. And, you know, I'm a prayer warrior and all this. Those things are easy to say, but are we really doing it? Is that what we're really doing in our lives? And that can be measured. You know, other people might see that everything looks great and all of that. But internally, you know, you know exactly where you are with God. I know exactly where I am with God. I know exactly where my heart is, where my emotions are, where my bitterness is, where my uh, love is, where my, you know, all the things I know. I mean, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm glad most people don't know where I am because at times I can be, you know, in a really like down or in a really, you know, haven't spent time in God's word or haven't spent time praying. And, but I'm not going to go around, you know, hanging a sign out telling people that. But we have to trust in the Lord. Psalms 44 says, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. You know, can you have joy in your life? Can you maintain joy in your life if you're not trusting in God? The answer is no. There's no gray area in that. Because joy comes from the Lord. So, very logic, logical, very common sense approach. If joy comes from the Lord... 
and you're not turning to the Lord and you're not trusting in the Lord, therefore you don't and you won't have joy because you're walking away from the person that it comes from. I mean, that's just how it is. And that's what I find in my life. When I'm not trusting in God, I'm not maintaining that joy that comes from Him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Not part of it, not a little bit, all of it. And lean not into thine own understanding. I mean, these times right now, if you say, oh, I've got all this figured out. No, you don't. There's nobody that has all this figured out. Only God knows all what's going on in the world and all the reasons for it. But it, what does it say here? If we trust in Him and we don't do things our own way, it says He will direct our paths. Well, what better time right now in a world and in a society in an economy that is so unsure, things are so sideways or upside down or whatever adjective you want to throw in there, things are so off. What better person than to have God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to say, hey, let me direct your path. Do you think he's going to mislead you? Do you think he's going to mislead me? See, if we're on his path, then we're going to have the joy that comes from the Lord. Again, easy to say, I know. Harder to implement. But is the implementation of this, is that on God or is that on you and me? Because the implementation is not God. God's made it very easy. It's, it's me, it's you that makes the implementation hard because we start to throw in our own thoughts, our own, hey God, if I do this, I want you to do that. And we start negotiating or whatever it is. There's things that we start to do that complicate this. And lastly here, focus on God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved. Study God's word. And, and not just, in a, and, you know, Pastor Daniel talks about this all the time in other preachers and, and, again, the kind of just the approach to it. Just because you sit down and read a whole chapter or ten chapters a day doesn't mean that you get anything about it. Doesn't mean you get anything from it or out of it. You've got to study. You've got to dig into it. You've got to say, how does this apply to my life today? What am I going through? What is God trying to tell me? It says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So get into God's word. If you're trying to find that joy and maintain it, dig in. Study God's word. The next is Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. What would God have you to do? What would God have me to do? How would God have me to react? What does God want of me? And it says here, if we're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things are going to be added unto you. Joy is one of those things that comes from God. So if we're seeking Him, we're getting the joy that He's promised. And then uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. You know, this is one of the things in my life that, you know, growing up, I felt like and, and was kind of taught and led that I needed to get down on my hands and knees 30 minutes every morning and cross my hands and earnestly pray. There's nothing wrong with that. But that was, if I could, if I could ever do that, which I rarely ever did, um, if I could ever do it, it didn't impact the rest of my day, really. Because I had another 23 and a half hours minus sleep that I had to interact with people and had to interact with the thoughts in my mind. You know, this is a thing that, you know, we as everyone, every, every Christian that I know of needs to work on studying God's word more, applying God's word more, and praying more, praying through all parts of the day. When that stress comes on or that anxiety comes on or that thought of misery or uncertainty comes on, grab you a Bible verse and start thinking about that. Grab a, a, a piece of music and start listening to that or start praying to God. And if you, if you can't get down on your knees, if you can't get into a closet, just do it in your mind. If you're in a meeting, a business meeting, a, a phone call, a conversation with someone, and that thought's coming to you like, I really want to say this, but I know it's not right, then start praying. Don't let the joy be taken away from you because you're not close to God. And so these are five things that I kind of deal with in my life, that I work on in my life, that I really have to pay attention to because 
in my life and in your life, it comes down to a choice. We have a choice to do things God's way. We have a, a choice to obey Him, to look at His Word and say, God, how am I supposed to deal with this family conflict? Or how am I supposed to deal with this COVID-19? Or how am I supposed to deal with bitterness? Or whatever it is, God, God in His Word has a way that we're to deal with that. Or we can choose to do things our own way, which unfortunately is a lot of the times you know, where I start out knee-jerk reactions or what's best for me or what would protect me most. And that leads to, you know, misery and stress and anxiety and conflict and bitterness. In my way, our way, if you're doing things your way and I'm doing things my way, it's leading us away from God. Our disobedience, the choice to disobey God is putting us out of fellowship with God, which is taking away our joy. But if we want to maintain that joy, you know, if we want that, you know, God's way leads us to, as Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about, the fruits of the Spirit, right, is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So if we want these things, if we don't just want to talk about them, if we want to find contentment and comfort and joy and peace and balance and all of those things, they don't come from ourselves. They don't come by making choices on our own or trying to do what we think is right. They come from God's Word. Joy comes from the Lord. And so if we are going to find it and maintain it, we're going to have to do things God's way. We're going to have to you know, get into His Word and study His Word and actually apply it to our lives. I hope this has been encouraging to you. I am very humbled and very honored uh, to be able to share with you, and I hope this will, will help you. I hope it will uh, give you some insight um, into, you know, what somebody else's struggles may be, because no matter, I'll kind of close with this, no matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what's going on, no matter the circumstances, no matter how you got there, whether you put yourself there or life just put you there, um, there's another Christian brother or another Christian sister who would be willing to talk to you, who would be willing to discuss where you are because others are there as well. You're not the only person who's alone. You're not the only person who's in the corner. Every Christian, if they're being honest, at some point in their relationship with God, at some point in their life, if not multiple times, have not known how to handle a situation. I know I have. Quite often, I find myself not knowing how to handle a situation, which normally leads to a bad decision because I do things my way, which hurts my joy, my relationship, my fellowship with God. But if I'll reach out to someone and talk to another um, brother in Christ, if I'll sit down with them on the phone or in, in per, well, not in person as much right now, um, I can really avoid uh, a lot of future hurt, but I can also get out of where I am. So I hope that's been encouraging to you. Again, thank you for letting me share with you, and I hope that you have a blessed day.